Joe Biden in his campaign trail in New York, he was talking about a possible nuclear war. Here comes the importance of your speech to the United Nations Security Council on nuclear weapons, Ukraine and Gaza. Could you elaborate on what you presented at the United Nations Security Council? And thank you for having me back on, Nima. It's good to see you. Um, so I was asked to brief uh, the United Nations Security Council on a meeting on Ukraine. And um, I chose to spend most of my time talking about the incredibly dangerous uh, escalatory trajectory that we, as a world, are on uh, in relation to that war. Uh, how uh, the tit for tat, the uh, not just uh, uh, what's occurring on uh, the battlefield, but also uh, geopolitically uh, in terms of, 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 of rhetoric, as well as actual decisions and choices that are being made um, is incredibly reckless uh, and puts us into a position where the logical outcome of this is a nuclear confrontation, a nuclear war between the U.S. and NATO and Russia, and only highlighted even the more so uh, in the last week or two by uh, the suggestion by the French and the Baltics of putting combat units into Ukraine. Um, I'm a member of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. If people want to go to Consortium News, uh, they will see that we released a memo this week explaining exactly why that is so dangerous. I believe the title of the memo is The French Road to Nuclear War. Um, and that was the, the gist of what I was speaking to the UN Security Council about, was the need for the Security Council, as well as the United Nations in general, to intervene to stop the war, uh, to, to, to force uh, a ceasefire, force negotiations, because the risk of the trajectory that we are on is something that no one should be willing to accept. You talk about this piece that you, together with other friends of our show and Veterans for Sanity, you wrote about how Europe, in particular Macron, is getting so radical toward this conflict. This guy was so important when this conflict started. He tried to make some sort of negotiations right. been, between the West and Russia. Now it's totally the opposite and nobody understands what's going on with him. Exactly. Uh, you know, go back two years and, and even a year ago and Macron was a voice of reason. Um, I wouldn't call him a, a voice of restraint, but he certainly was more constraining in his, what he was saying than certainly, say, the Americans or the British, uh, even the Germans at time, particularly the German foreign minister. Um, I think, uh, you know, certainly there are that um, are. It, it is, it, you know, it, it's hard to speculate as to what the reasons are. Uh, I don't know French politics to understand why such a gambit like this. Uh, you know, choosing to put forward such an incredibly, uh, 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 you know, uh, reckless uh, ambit to, uh, you know, increase the war. Uh, there's no evidence that adding a NATO army, basically, which is what they are advocating, would win this war for Ukraine. You would need much greater uh, forces are recommending. I mean, these forces that they are saying go into uh, France, whether it's the 2,000 troops that, I mean, for, for France to send into Ukraine, whether it's the 2,000 troops that Macron initially uh, suggested, or it's the 20,000 French troops plus 40,000 NATO troops that a French general recommended in a newspaper, Le Monde, um, you know, it doesn't matter. That's not enough to win the war. I mean, in order for the U.S., NATO, and Ukraine to win this war, you need to put an actual NATO army into uh, Ukraine. And I mean it in the sense of the the the, the military uh, sense, the military definition of an army, uh, three to five core of uh, armor and mechanized forces, along with all the supporting uh, aviation, uh, missile fires, uh, naval assets, that will be required. And in, as we discussed in our uh, memorandum, our VIPS memorandum, Veteran Intelligence Professional for Sanity, um, as we discussed in that, just by the very nature of how NATO would be expected to operate in combat, uh, the responsible manner. Um, I don't know if we talked about how irresponsible Ukraine has been by not 
uh, you know, as, as we've learned the last few weeks, uh, uh, you know, by not preparing defensive lines uh, as they should have, uh, you would expect NATO to do things in a manner that is uh, what you would term the responsible way to do things. And, and you know, that means that they would engage in uh, long range uh, missile and rocket fire, uh, air strikes, uh, strikes from naval vessels in support of their ground forces. There's no other way they could do it. Uh, you know, it, unless they just wanted their troops to be massacred, uh, you know, without uh, giving them all the support that, you, you know, they're obligated to. And, and that in turn, those types of long range strikes into Russia would result in Russian counterstrikes, uh, particularly going after NATO targets. Uh, the French have aircraft in Romania right now. That's conceivably where they would fly their air support for their French troops out of. So just that one location alone would cause uh, Russian strikes into a NATO country, let alone everything else you could presume would happen as well. Uh, you know, it, it, that builds, right? And so you have the corresponding uh, attacks on one another that builds until you reach this threshold. And the Russians have said this clearly over and over again, that they have a red line, they have a threshold. They also have doctrinal requirements that they file that if certain, uh, if their command and control facilities, if their headquarters are struck, in these long range fires, these long range strikes by NATO, then they will they will respond with nuclear weapons. That's what their doctrines call for. And we have people who we talk with, who talk with the Russians, including uh, serving diplomats and generals in the Russian forces, who are clear that they are not bluffing. And incredibly, we have many in the West, uh, particularly in the US and the UK, who claim that the Russians are bluffing. And now back to your point, though, with the French is that, uh, you know, you've now seen this mania, this hysteria, that this 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 war fever extend to the French. And I don't understand. I think the, the explanation would be from Macron. And, and if people have a better view of this than I do, please put something in the comments. But you would expect that, OK, the easy answer would be, well, Macron is fondering uh, internally in France, and this is a way to distract the French people by going to war overseas. Uh, tried and true method. Uh, the Greeks use this. The Romans use this. Uh, you know, I mean, this is certainly uh, something that that rulers have always done to distract the people uh, from their own internal problems. Don't worry about inflation. Uh, don't worry about homelessness. Don't worry about issues with uh, uh, just social services, immigration, etc. Uh, we're at war. You have to unite around this common enemy. Um, you know, and in and, and, and democracies, wartime presidents often do well. So is that the calculation that Macron is under? Um, I mean, there's also, too, uh, 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 even that we said, uh, Nima, about the French showing some degree of responsibility in their rhetoric for the first year or so of this war, we also have to acknowledge that uh, even as they were saying, maybe not as uh, uh, brazen or aggressive uh, uh, language and talking points as, say, the Americans or the British, uh, we also did have seen a commitment to the French to building up their military. And the French have uh, certainly have an imperial uh, past. They have a colonial past. They are neo-colonialists. Uh, and so the idea of the French army restoring its former glory is something that I think for many Americans, we don't recognize that desire. And I think for many of us, when we're shocked, when we go to Europe, and you go to even these countries that you 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 kind of the the uh, consensus is that these are peace loving diplomacy based countries uh, like the Scandinavians, and then you see all these statues in their capitals to their former admirals and to their former uh, you know those who led the conquests of of other lands. Uh, you understand that there is an imperial sentiment there, a desire for the lost empire, and then of course there's just the whole aspect of that. Like, this is good for those who are hungry for power. That if you want to do well in a Western democracy, align yourself with the military industrial complex, align yourself with the intelligence services, go with the tried and true rhetoric 
of uh, that have has existed for millennium of uh you know focus on an enemy overseas to or across your borders in order to uh, distract your people from whatever failings you are uh providing them on a societal level uh so it is it is it is perplexing but i think when we pull it back we can understand where the sentiment for war is coming from um, and certainly when I was in the United Nations Security Council uh, last week, uh, the French were as uh, hawkish uh, as anyone else at that uh, uh, you know, Security Council table. Two important elements, if that would be on the path of the escalation, would be these Taurus missiles and F-16s, mm. because both of them are capable of carrying nuclear bombs. Do you think that at the end of the day, the policy would be sending this type of weapons to Ukraine. And the other thing that we know that mobilization is not going the way that Ukraine and the West want it to be. How do you see the latest events in Ukraine, the battlefield in Ukraine right now? Well, certainly this idea that somehow the West is going to introduce a wonder weapon uh, to the Ukrainians that are going to help them win the war, just straight out of, you know, a Hollywood picture uh is 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 you know ludicrous uh and the idea that the russians just won't counter it is an idea that is clearly shown by just looking at the last two years of this war uh, for every new tactic or technology that the uh west and ukraine have introduced into the war the russians have countered and that's just the way of war uh, that's just the nature of warfare. Uh, I, I did a lot of counter IED work. It's improvised explosive device work when I was in Iraq, uh, you know, going out looking for roadside bombs. And for every, uh, and this is on a tactical level, so you're not even talking on the operation or strategic level, but it's on the tactical level, you know, so on the daily ground fighting, uh, you know, small unit level. Uh, for every new tactic or technique or uh, or technology or procedure that we we brought in, we brought in new uh, uh, <clears throat> ground penetrating radar, or or we drove our vehicles a different manner. Um, within 30, 45, at the most 60 days, but generally within 30 to 45 days, the insurgency, the resistance had countered whatever we had done. And then, of course, we had to develop a counter to the counter. You know, until eventually you've got counters to counters uh, that, you know, if you were to write it all out, it'd be three pages long of writing the word counter. Um, and that's what you see here. So you blow up the Nord Stream pipeline, you attack the Kerch Bridge. Uh, the result, of course, is uh, the strikes by Russia on uh, Ukrainian energy infrastructure. There were strikes on, by Russia on uh, uh, Ukrainian port facilities. I mean, the same thing, too. You introduce, uh, you know, storm shadow missiles or you introduce high Mars rockets. Just take your pick. And Russia introduces new weapon systems as well. Certainly, you can look at the the, the utilization of glide bombs uh, that they've been so successful, particularly in these last, uh, say, four or five months in utilizing. They've had them for much longer, but certainly as well, too, their use of hypersonic uh, weapons. I mean, so whatever you're going to introduce, the Russians will counter. Um, and it's, it's just not in a way of a tit for tat. It's also, too, that your technology is only going to last for so long. So it didn't take very long, a few months, uh, for the Russians to start to be able to counter the HIMARS rockets, right? To 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 affect the GPS that 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 uh, coordinates uh, those rockets. And the same thing too. You talk to anyone about the drone war. I mean, it's every thirty days. It's a different situation in Ukraine with the drone war. A lot of it having to do with uh, electronic countermeasures and and the the battle over the electromagnetic uh, uh, spectrum. Right. So it's stuff that, you know, way, way over my head in terms of why I mean, I'm just happy when I flip a switch and the lights come on. Right. Let alone understanding frequencies, bandwidths, how these things operate, but know enough to know that it does constantly change and that whatever you introduce is going to and more often than not, what your enemy does, what they counter with is an escalation is something with greater firepower, is something with a larger payload, is something with a greater range, or the tech or the tactic that they're using, what how they're, the operation that they're conducting is more destructive or it's more expansive in its scale. And so to think that somehow you're going to introduce Taurus missiles and F-16s, again, as you said, a, a, you know, a, a, a nuclear capable the F-16s can carry the B-61s. Um, the the idea of that somehow the Russians are not going 
to respond or counter. And we've see, we've heard that because when um, the response from the Russians to uh, one, this, again, this idea of introducing NATO combat units into Ukraine has been to remind the world of their nuclear capabilities, of their nuclear forces. Uh, they say this over and over again. And so to not take it, not, not to take them at face value, to think that they're bluffing just because... Uh, you know, some there are some Western analysts who claim that uh, we have passed Russian red lines. We're not even really certain if we those Russian red lines existed. I think a lot of what in the West are cited as Russian red lines to then say, look, the Russians didn't enforce those red lines. We can keep going. I don't even know if the Russians ever were the whatever actually instituted those. But if you go back and you look certainly at Russia in the last 25 years uh, under Vladimir Putin's leadership, uh, you see a country that when it says it will do something, it does something. Right. So whether it's in Chechnya, if it's in Georgia, I think Syria is the best example. Uh, you know, in Syria, the Russians said, if you continue this war against our ally, we will intervene. And they did so. And I was part of things in Washington, D.C. in that 2014, 2015 time frame. And this is why I'm so aggrieved and, and bothered by what I hear now, because I heard the same things 10 years ago. The Russians aren't serious. The Russians don't have the capacity. They don't have the capability to put forces in Syria, uh, you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sure enough, and, you know, the great the great war of Obama's second presidency, the Americans lost it and doomed about a half million Syrians to their deaths and many more millions of refugees and just completely destroyed that nation all on this idea that, oh, we the Russians are bluffing. The Russians won't go into Syria. And if they do, they can't do anything about it. They're going to be, you know, they're they're what's the, what's the famous line I hear a lot of people saying it now because it's, it's a good way to mock the Americans in the West for their understanding and for what how they've depicted the, the, the you know the uh, uh, you know they've depicted Russia. So you hear a lot of commentators bring this up again, but it's important to do it. You know, it's that John McCain line that Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country, and you know couldn't be farther from the truth that we've seen, particularly uh, you know in their ability to withstand all this supposed. Uh, 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 impossible to withstand pressure uh, from the West. The other thing would be why the Biden administration is insisting on this failed policy. When Victoria Nuland resigned, we thought that this would be a big change in the Biden administration. But it doesn't seem that the Biden administration is thinking of any of this. Is it going to help them in 2024, in your opinion? Well, they, they think it will. They they think it will. And that's what matters. Uh, I don't think it will, but they think it will. And I think what their calculation is, is that their base, the Democratic Party loyalists, the ones who showed up uh, to give Joe Biden $25 million at that fundraiser you spoke about, Neem, that's what they raised. They raised, they raised $25 million in one night. Those people all identify with the war in Ukraine as a struggle of good versus evil. And they also tie that directly into their own partisan politics, their own identity team-based politics, wherein uh, Russia equals evil, Russia equals Putin, Putin equals Trump. So there is an identity among the Democratic Party base uh, that says that this war is a personification for me, as an individual, I have to support this war because this is where I stand in the global cosmic universal struggle of good versus evil. And that is something that may not be reflected among most Americans, but it is among the party base. And I think this is why you go back to September and Joe Biden's first campaign ad is the campaign ad about Ukraine. Now, I was hoping that when everything happened in Palestine with, with the October 7th attacks and then, of course, the, this genocide has been occurring for almost six months now, uh, and the way Ukraine fell off the pages of the newspapers, fell off the reporting on the cable news networks, that that would, and the fact that most Americans didn't care, that most Americans didn't seem to notice, that that would have been a sign to the Biden administration of, look, you can let Ukraine go. It's not going to cost you politically. But they obviously don't see it that way. 
they again they've been won for one reason again i keep and i really should stress this because i feel like i just mentioned it but it's such an important component of the democratic party's national politics uh, even extends down on state politics uh, level state political levels uh, but their national level is this connection of the republican party to russia this is what they've been running on since 2015 and they're not going to let it go they feel that this is what, again, gives their base some type of identity that propels them into being part of this, right, this struggle of good versus evil. You know, and then there's all the other components that go into this one that's good for the military industrial complex. It's also this is what the foreign policy establishment in D.C., the blob, this is what they believe. Uh, right. They believe in the expansion of the American empire into Ukraine. They believe in the necessity of destroying Russia to finish what we had to, to finish what we had tried to do back in the 90s by, you know, 90, as people recall, after the Soviet Union uh, comes into the uh, Soviet Union go, goes out of existence and, and Russia becomes into being basically in the modern sense, the Americans, the West, but really the Americans attempt to loot Russia. And so the idea that there's a lot of Americans who have chips on their shoulders, that what they saw as rightfully theirs, because we are the empire, we won the Cold War, we deserve to have our energy companies take the resources in Russia, for example, that that project now has an opportunity for success if we could just get regime change in Russia. So the way to do that, and they're sticking to this, that because God forbid they understand that they're, it's not working, um, but this is also who they are. They wouldn't be in their positions if they weren't so self-righteously arrogant, if they weren't such true believers in their own purposes and missions, You know, both individuals and institutions I'm talking about. But this idea that we are going to suck you, Russia into this war, and it's going to cause Russia to bleed out, that's going to cause catastrophe. Uh, uh, consequences to the Russian people, and then they're going to rise up and overthrow Vladimir Putin. Uh, you know, I mean, that's a standard line that they've used for decades now with their, uh, you know, massively failed sanction policies around the world. But that's what that's what they believe. It's an article of faith to them. They are the loyal servants of the empire, and that's what the empire requires of them for them to be in those positions within those institutions where they have, if not power, at least they have proximity to power, as well as their own ideologies are, are reaffirmed. So, I mean, you know, and then he's getting the you know, aspect of it as well, right? What's touching on there is that the empire will never admit defeat. And also the way that the American empire wins wars is by being able to waste more than others. And so the calculation is that we can waste more than Russia. Uh, you know, and that's a calculation that has not proven true, of course, and they're actually the American empire is on the wrong side of that equation right now. But I think their estimation is that if we could just keep this house of cards in Ukraine afloat, then we can get to the point where our munition factors are up and running. And then we've got the world's reserve currency behind us and we can continue this war and Russia at some point will stumble. They don't have the world's reserve currency. They have other constraints that we don't have being the West. Some of those restraints, some of those constraints are real. Some of those are just a fanciful imagination of, of the West. Uh, but I will also say that there is some, I do believe there is some argument behind what they're saying. And this is why I believe Russia, it's in their best interest to end this war in the next year or two, because they do not have the world's reserve currency behind them. That And that the war, wartime economy for Russia is something that will be very difficult to sustain. It's one thing for the Americans, for our country to be spending uh, half our budget, federal budget every year on our military. It's different for another country uh, to do so. And as we see Russia's spending on their military, uh, you know, cross the 30, 35 percent threshold for their for their federal spending, um, you know, you start to wonder what consequences will they have? But all that said, the Russians have shown themselves to be very adept, very uh, smart, very competent 
at managing their economy. They certainly prepared for this war very well. Uh, this war has also opened up uh, you know, by necessity, if you will. So again, another massive failure of the sanctions programs, more markets uh, for Russia. So Russia has turned east and south, if you will, rather than focusing on the West. Uh, whether Russia ever cares to go back to the West, I think is a good question. I think maybe not. Uh, but I think certainly, um, you know, the trajectory of this war, everything I'm saying there, that's all speculation. And that runs headlong into what we were talking about earlier, is that, you know, where the Russian economy is in three or four years is is is, is a great topic uh, for you and I to 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 banter about. But the reality is we won't make it that far if the current escalation of this war continues and we go into a U.S., NATO, Russia war, which would end up being a nuclear war. The other important policy for the Biden administration would be the policy in Gaza that would influence his path to victory in 2024 tremendously. How do you find his policy right now? We know that there are serious disagreements between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu administration. The calculation they made. And I, it was that the loss of votes from uh, progressive voters in the U.S. would be less of a consequence to the Democratic Party than the loss of the Israeli lobby support. Uh, so however many less millions of votes they would get, three, four, five in November 2024, because people were so upset about their role in the genocide in Gaza, was not going to matter as much as a loss of support from the Israeli lobby. That's the calculation I think they made. I think what they're realizing is their calculation was off and that more people are aggrieved by this. I think they didn't think this genocide would last as long. I didn't think they would, they, they would, uh, I, they, I think they thought that the narrative control they've seen over things occurring with Israel through the mainstream media would remain the same it would be. So if you go back and look at how the mainstream media, the U.S. corporate media covered, uh, say, Operation Cast Lead by the Israelis in Gaza in 09, Protective Edge in 2014, the Great March of Return in 2018, all right, the 2020, even the 2021, uh, uh, the savage attacks uh, uh, by Israel on Gaza in 2021 that followed uh, Israel's, you know, brutal beatings of people in the Al-Aqsa Mosque and all other types of stuff that you look at and you say, good God, you know, but even three years ago, uh, people here in the U.S. didn't have as much access to that as we have now watching this genocide. And the fact that it is so prevalent um, in terms of what Americans are able to consume and understand. And you see that with, you know, polling that came out last week from, uh, well, two sets of polls we should talk about. One uh, is uh, that Gallup found that 55% of Americans are opposed to Israeli military operations in, in Gaza. And that's the way they describe it. They didn't describe it as, as a genocide. I'm sure if they actually described it accurately, more would be opposed to it. But 55% of Americans are opposed and only 36% are in support. And that's a drop of 14 points in terms of who's supporting this war in the U.S. since November. And you might think, oh my God, it should be like 80 80, 90 percent are opposed to this thing. But when you factor in, you take the context of it, you factor in just what we were talking about, the media, right? How the media narrative among the corporate media, the legacy established media in the U.S., which still is massive. We can't, for all the great successes we're seeing with independent and alternative media, we still can't, you know, we're not putting any nails in the coffin uh, of the me legacy media, the corporate media, you can you might want to start measuring, but you know don't we're not hammering nails anytime soon. Um, so they still have such an influence, but uh, uh, but so with that and the fact that our politicians, uh, just uh, almost all of them, particularly on the federal level, the national level, repeat APAC talking points. The fact that fifty five percent of Americans are opposed to this thing against that that can against that narrative that 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 wall of lies and mistruths and misinformation being thrown at them about this genocide i mean that that's really that's really remarkable now the other side is that hugh had a poll week before that that found that only 52 percent of americans uh could tell you whether more israelis have been killed or more palestinians have been killed so roughly half of americans don't know that more Palestinians have been killed than Israelis by a factor of what, about 33 or 34 at least, 
right? So uh, you still have that issue of people not knowing about this, people being unaware of what's happening, people being ignorant. Um, and some of it is willful, people just not paying attention. But some of it is because if you watch this media, if you read the Times or the Post, you get a very, very blurred uh, you know, vision of what's going on there. It's very opaque and it's, and it's done, uh, in a very deliberate manner. We have the studies, we have the research that has shown that type of bias in the reporting by CNN, by, uh, MSNBC, by Fox, by the New York times, by the Washington post, by the LA times, by the CBC, by the BBC, right? We have that. We have the research that shows that this is a clear and deliberate attempt at making sure the Israeli narrative is what's being put forward. Uh, so, I mean, all that said, it, it, you know, it shows that the Biden administration, the White House the campaign, whoever made this may have made a miscalculation. And so now they are trying to do damage control. And so they are trying to do things in a manner that appeals to their progressive voters uh, and to people who are not going to turn out. And it's not just going to affect and hurt Biden. It's going to affect and hurt the entire Democratic Party. Because if people don't turn out to vote for the president, well, then they're not voting for governors, not voting for state legislatures, they're not voting for uh, members of Congress, et cetera. So the down ballot consequences are, are quite severe for the Democratic Party, potentially. Um, so I think what the White House is trying to do is trying to do, you know, both things, both both say that, they are uh, doing what they can to restrain the Israelis. They are, uh, they've gone into overdrive in trying to portray this as the actions of a lone man. So they speak constantly of Netanyahu, not the Israeli government. So they're trying to scapegoat Netanyahu when the reality is, is that this, what we're seeing in Gaza is the will of the Israeli people. Netanyahu is absolutely correct when he says that he has the full support of the parliament or almost the full support of the parliament. He has the entire support of his cabinet. Uh, you know, whoever's going to replace him like Benny Gantz uh, would not be doing anything differently. Uh, maybe his rhetoric wouldn't be as, 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 as obscene as Netanyahu's, but on the ground where it really matters, it wouldn't be any different. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and so the Americans are trying to say, look, we're, we're doing our best here. We're trying to restrain this. If Netanyahu wasn't there, then this would all be going a different way. Things would be much better. It's all Netanyahu's fault. So, you know, that that's what they can point to, right? He's a scapegoat. And at the same time, too, of course, providing all the C-17s worth of bombs and missiles and rockets and shells that are landing daily in Israel, you know, the cargo ship full of military support that arrives every third or fourth day in Israel. That all continues as well as a diplomatic cover, uh, whether it's just that really ham handed and gross manner that the United States abstained from the ceasefire resolution this week, which they immediately then in just it's just shocking the levels, Nima, that they're lying. It's just shocking. Uh, they're so brazen with their lies. It's so disgusting. Um, and we have to keep that in mind because these are the people that we're up against. These people you cannot reason with. These are psychopaths. So they will say things like this Security Council resolution is non-binding when all Security Council resolutions are binding. It's international law. But now you're going to claim that this one's not. I mean, it's like you're dealing with a child when you're playing a board game who is making up the rules as they go along. That's what we're dealing with here. But they're not children. They're full grown psychopathic individuals whose only purpose is power. Uh, you know, and then you see as well, the State Department doing the same thing. I mean, Matt Miller, uh, you know, this week he he had a, you know, just just in the sense of uh, the spokesperson or State Department, you know, saying that the State Department has certified that the Israelis have not violated international law, whether in their killing of uh, civilians or in their starvation of civilians, the Israelis are not violating international law. Just, just absolutely, again, I mean, you, you get um, you struck for a loss of words here. And then when uh, Francesca Albanese, uh, God bless her, uh, when she, through her role as the UN Special Rapporteur uh, for Palestine, releases her report, incredibly documented, very thorough. Uh, I don't know how you argue with it. Uh, he says, he's, Matt Miller slanders her and says that she has a long history of anti-Semitic remark. 
which is absolutely untrue. But these people will just lie and lie. And so I think as the months go on, as this thing gets worse, if uh, Israel does not hurry up and finish this, which is what I think most uh, people, I think if you were in a room with Thomas Greenfield and Blinken and Sullivan and Kirby and Austin, you know, I think the conversation would be uh, they need to hurry up and finish this. Right. This has gone on way too long. I think that was, again, a calculation that it's only going to last for a couple months and then it'll be almost a year for the elections and the American people will forget about it. And, uh, you know, I, hopefully people do not forget about it. I certainly don't want to see a Trump presidency. I don't want to see an RFK presidency. But, you know, you cannot reelect someone who has uh, participated, who has conducted genocide. Uh, like Joe Biden has. And we have to use that language. We can't say support or complicit because, you know, it, it goes beyond that. This is an American genocide as much as it is, as much as it is an Israeli genocide. Is the United States capable of convincing the Netanyahu administration to not attacking Rafa? Well, I think they view collective punishment has to be collective. So you can't leave any any spot of the ground unscathed. And I think that, you know, historically, you look at how nations have done that to other people, and that's the way it has to be total. It has to be complete. Um, it allows for the public relations, right, the propaganda, uh, the mission accomplished moment, right, where uh, Netanyahu can say, we have vanquished Hamas. They had 24 battalions. We've destroyed all 24 battalions. Um, although they're not using destroyed now, they're using the word dismantled, I think. Uh, which is a, a way that they can weasel out of the fact that, uh, yeah, no, they didn't destroy Hamas and Hamas is going to keep attacking them for as long as they occupy them, as long as they besiege the Gazan people, there will be a resistance, uh, a violent resistance. Um, so, um, you know, but the, the, I think what the hope is, is that, well, two things. One, this is, part, this is the plan all along, right? The ethnic cleansing. And then the idea you make it so that no spot in Gaza is inhabitable. And then there's the idea that you start shipping these people out. And oh, as you finish your destruction of Gaza, as the land is uninhabitable, just saw an article today about the the, the how just, just the environmental devastation there. You know, the uh, Gazans aren't going to be able to grow food anymore. I mean, the land has been that, that sullied, it's been that defiled. Uh, so where are they going to go? Uh, you know, it's easy for, for uh, you and I and everyone else watching, right, to be like, ah, oh, this remains steadfast. But then when you're there with your family and you've survived that, why take the risk again? You know, I mean, so, you know, the, the, it just so happens that the United States is building this pier uh, that will be ready uh, when the Israelis are done with their killing. Uh, and so uh, potentially the pier could bring things in, but it also can take things out. And so is that part of it, right? This idea of that the pier will be utilized uh, to uh, expel, to deport Palestinians. Um, if the Egyptians and Jordanians are not going to take them across their borders, well, then you have to get them out. And there's no airport in Gaza, uh, thanks to the Israelis, of course, but there's no airport. So you got to get them out by ship. So, I mean, is that part of this as well? Because this was an ethnic cleansing campaign from the start. It is it is for, for many Israelis, this is the coda. This is the final phase of an eight decade long, actually it's longer than that, but but if Israel proper, uh, eight decade long ethnic cleansing campaign. This was the best opportunity they were gonna ever gonna have. They were gonna utilize it and they were gonna carry it out. And we have to look at their actions, not at their words, not at whatever rhetoric, not, I mean, but they've made it clear, uh, you know, that this is what they are going to do based upon my, how they've been acting, their conduct. Um, and it will transition after the destruction of Rafa into a new phase, uh, what we would call, we called in Iraq and Afghanistan, security and stability operations. Uh, and that what that means is that the Israelis, if they continue to go along with this, will have to garrison Gaza with at least a division, maybe two divisions, which is what they have in Gaza right now, from what I understand. And then the terror on the people, the you know that that form of subjugation through military occupation. Well, of course, it, it's going to continue the resistance, which then allows the Israelis to justify what they're doing to continue their ethnic cleansing, continue their collective punishment, but also too, it makes life 
unbearable. It makes life terrible. And people will try and get out because, my God, we, we've survived it this far. How could I stay here with my children? You know, how could I do this to my family? I mean, I think anyone sane and reasonable would see it that way. So you present the opportunity of, hey, here's a ship. You know, get on it and you're going to go to wherever, you know, I mean, it, but at that point, anywhere will seem better than what you've endured and what the future looks like, because the Israelis are clear that there will be no future for Gaza. There will be no Palestine if there is no two state solution, as they've been emphatic about. Uh, Israel has been emphatic, about, not Netanyahu, you know, uh, not Smotrich or Ben Gavir, but Israel. Has been emphatic about the people have been emphatic back that there will be no state for palestine then what are you looking at permanent occupation so you can understand how people will then say yes i will go uh it's terrible it's tragic it's awful you know uh, uh my heart is with the resistance of course but it's also understandable how you could see this ethnic cleansing campaign uh reach fruition you know reach it achieve its success and of course it's all based upon the Americans and the Americans, of course, want to just see it done and over with so that they can get to talking about, uh, you know, the conversation in the U.S. turns towards uh, uh, either, uh, you know, domestic issues, uh, Trump's. Uh, I don't even know how many uh, <laughs> how many court hearings he'll have. Right. How many, how many I don't even know how many indictments he's got, you know, that type of thing. But his criminal his criminal problems, uh, you know, as well, then, too. And maybe it circles back and. Uh, it's, you know, the blue and yellow flags come out again, right? This great struggle of good versus evil that, as we were talking about before, I'm a part of. Uh, but um, yeah, it certainly uh, does not bode well uh, for Joe Biden. And I would tell you, I, I don't understand this just to, to go to uh, the, the election further. Uh, and I mentioned RFK briefly, but why, you know, RFK's dedication to Israel uh, he is more pro-Israel in many ways in some of his his, his messaging uh, than Biden or Trump is. Biden being the most biggest pro-Israel guy in, in D.C. No one's received more money from the Israel lobby than Joe Biden. When he Everything we talk about Israel, we always have to keep in mind that Biden does believe in Israel. He is a Zionist. He believes in the greater Israel project. Uh, and he believes, he really does believe, like most uh, in the American foreign policy establishment, that an Israel first policy in the Middle East is best for American interests. Uh, and that all is something that's inherited from the British Empire, uh, which the Americans took over from this idea of having a loyal base in a hostile sea of Arabs. The British Governor Gen General of Jerusalem in the 1930s described what Britain was doing in Palestine as creating a loyal Jewish Ulster in the midst of potentially hostile sea of Arabs. And that's what the Americans took over from. So the inertia of that propels this idea of why Israel is in the best interest of the United States. But if RFK Jr., imagine if he was running on a platform denouncing this genocide, calling it for it was, recognizing the evil of it, and the U.S. role in it, I think, my God, he'd be pulling about 25% right now. And as it went forward, you'd have more and more people supporting him, more and more people saying, well, you know, I'm not really crazy about what he says about this. This kind of annoys me about him. However, uh, what he's saying about Palestine is absolutely right. And th for that reason, I will vote for him over Trump or Biden. And he has the money behind him in a way that, you know, Jill Stein, who is, you know, the person I support, doesn't have. And the way that Cornell West doesn't have, the way that the libertarians won't have. Uh, so, uh, you know, just on pure, but uh, obviously Kennedy is a Zionist. Those he holds close to him are Zionists. And that's why they've not made that uh, political course correction. Mm -hmm.